Um, I said earlier on when I introduced you, you had, you've had an amazing career. Um, you've had some in, insane things happen to you. You've been through various things throughout your whole career. And this is not it. That's not it. That's not all of it. So you've struggled your entire career with uh, an addiction to gambling. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you look back at it now, because at the time you, you don't realize you have a problem, I'm okay. assuming. That's why you continue to do what you're doing. At what point, when did you start? And then at what point did you think or know that you had a, had a gambling problem? Well, it's quite complicated, but when you, when, you, when you break it all down in GA with a fellowship, with a group, it becomes quite clear. It becomes a lot more clearer. You know, I always think clear mind, clear path. You've got a clear mind. Your path is very clear as well then, you know, rather than addictions and problems and dramas, you know what I mean? You clear all that and you get a clear path to everything. It just goes, whoosh, that's what happens, you know? And that's what happened to me with the gambling. It, was, uh, it started very, very young when I used to watch my father play a lot. My father played at semi-pro and I was always on the bus with my dad and following him five, six, seven years of age. And, um, and after the games, when he played at home for a Welsh team, they used to have these little strips. You could buy three for like two pound. My father would buy me pop and crisps. He'd have a couple of pints with the lads, with the teammates and that. I'd have pop and crisps, I'd be five or six years of age. And I'd just sit in the corner, you know, just, there'd be other kids there, other players. Yeah, the senior team would have kids. Or I'd be kicking the ball about round the back somewhere. And you could buy these little tickets, these little fruits that it was. So behind the ticket, there was three fruits, like an apple, a strawberry, a banana, grapes, whatever. And if they matched, you'd, you'd win sort of 50 pence or something like that. Or, you know, you, you'd win a, a free glass of Coke or a, I don't know. And I used to nag my dad all the time. Oh, I'd, be, I'd be there. I'd be a little, small little kid. And I'd be there, Daddy, can I have on Monday? I want more strips, I want more strips. And I think it leads off from there. That little wanting to win, um, just peeling them off and seeing what's behind the... And it's crazy to think I can go back 40 years to when I'm five years of age. That's where my first experience of... People would say, well, it's not gambling, John. Well, it is gambling. The lottery is gambling, you know. Um, Raffle tickets is gambling. You're buying something, you're doing good, you're putting something into a charity, but you're doing that to try and win something. Yeah. That's the same thing as going to a bookies and back in the horse, you're trying to win money, or a dog or whatever, a greyhound. So that's when it started. And then when I was 16, I had a wonderful opportunity to start my career. I got asked to go up to Luton, 300 miles away from Swansea, where I lived to become an apprentice, to start, start on my football. So it was always a dream. I was very determined. I didn't want to go back. I wasn't homesick. I wanted to make it. In my mind, I wasn't going home. I was always going to make it. I was always going to get on somehow. Um, I had the right attitude, you know, which to succeed. Um, and then I, I made this big, big area. I, I, I stole from a teammate at Luton and, um, and I got suspended from the club. But this addiction was so strong, uh, the club decided to take me back. So initially, that could have ruined my career. That should have been enough for me to stop. Wasn't enough because addictions are ridiculously strong. They're so hard to break, to break down and get clean. Um, and, and, you know, if you're an addict, the lengths you would go to get a drink if you're an alcoholic or if you're searching for drugs or in my case it was gambling you know the lengths that addicts go um, because they're addicts they're not bad people they're ill they're not yeah. well and I wasn't well for many years with the gambling um, so then I got taken back they give me a second chance then my career just flew from there and I always gambled at all the clubs I was at, I always gambled. Whether it but was it was a golf. cultural thing, wasn't it? Because I remember when I came to England. Yeah, but not every gambler's market. 
not everybody gambled. I know, I know it was a cultural thing. I know, I know there was a lot of you know black market gambling as well, where you had the private bookmakers. You didn't have to gamble through Ladbrokes or, or William Hills or Sunderland's or Stan James or all these different companies. Um, generally, you know, it was a bookies on the corner down the road, an unlicensed bookmaker where you could gamble or whatever. And not everybody gambled. You know, lots of people did, but lots of people didn't as well. People were wiser. They buy property. They they put money into their pension. You know, they they. Um, but it was always something that started, and I never I never got treatment. I never got. I never spoke about it. And it, it, it's something that if you're a gambler, gamblers listening to this, if you're a gambler and you're gambling every week, you will end up skint. And you will never stop gambling unless you get therapy, unless you go to GA, Gamblers Anonymous. And I quickly realized that because I thought I could just stop. And I did stop for periods. I did stop for six months. And I did stop for eight months, you know, when my wife would say to me, oh, look, you know, I would stop. Um, I'd always get drawn back. I'd always get drawn back, you know. And now I'm 10 years. I'm 10 years without a bet. 2009 was my but the mark. turning point was in 2009 because the turning point was um i'd been out i was in swansea i'd come out of, I'd come out of hospital and um while i was in hospital so this is after your the whole cancer yeah, this was after, yeah because while i was in hospital um my wife couldn't pay the bills my car everything the direct debits and food and things like that yes she had money to buy food yeah you know but um, generally, you know, and a good friend of mine went round the house and he lent her some money. And when I came out of the hospital, and this is John Hartson, who I mean, lives in his career, you know, living in a house in Wales. And, and when I came out, she explained to me that what had happened, you know, and you'd think that would be enough for me to say, I won't bet again. You know, I just spent six weeks in hospital. My wife was heavily pregnant um, with Stephanie my third daughter um and you think that would be enough you think that would be you know my wife telling me that she's she stood by my bed every night when i was in hospital watch me sleep there for everything i needed her husband was literally dying on on, on the bed you know wires and tubes coming through everywhere you know and she was sitting there pregnant with two kids at home you know when she explained to me it was like right okay yeah 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 i continued to gamble unbelievable i continue to gamble that's how strong an addiction gambling is and it's rife there are millions of people out there struggling taking their lives through gambling through debt everything else um and then what happened was about three or four months then down the line i was still gambling every penny i had um I'd been out on a particular afternoon session with a couple of friends and I'd slept at a three story house. I'd slept on the middle floor. My wife was on the top floor. The bedroom was on the top floor, but I'd gone in the other spare room. Um, and I can hear banging in the morning. I can hear banging almost like just what's that thud, eight o'clock in the morning. And it was my wife pulling the suitcases down the stairs, bang, 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 you know, just by the wheels, you know? And then she just came in the bedroom and she said, John, I, um, I booked the flight. She said, that's it. She said, I can't, I can't hang around. She said, I, um, I love you so much. She said, what you're putting yourself through, she says, it's killing me. It's killing me, she said, and it's killing you. She said, I shit, your stress, your moods. She said, and I put up with it for so long. She said, um, I think so much of you. She said, I cannot sit back and watch you do this anymore. She said, so I booked a flight and I'm going this afternoon with the girls and me. She was seven or eight months pregnant. She was on the cusp of being able to fly. Um, and I just broke down. I broke down in tears. I was on my hands and knees pleading with her to not to go. I'll change. Um, I won't gamble. And she, she just, she'd had enough. Literally. And I'd had enough. That was my moment. That was my moment where they say you hit rock bottom. You have to hit rock bottom. And I was, I was there, rock bottom. What, what do you do then? Who do you call? What do you do? Where do you go? 
rock bottom. And she said to me, I want you to get on the phone and phone GA, Gamblers Anonymous, now. And I'm not doing it for you. Like, I've done everything for you. Everything. Almost wiped your backside that time. Not doing it for you anymore. You do it and show me that you're serious about doing it. And I'd had enough. I'd had enough, like, of the... I'd had enough of the lies, the deceit, you know, the... Just being an idiot, being stupid, being disrespectful, um, you know. And people used to say, Bill, John, pull yourself together. I can't believe you go next door for the bet. And I, I just didn't listen. I just didn't listen because I was addicted. I was an addict. So I'd had enough as well. I'd had enough at that time. That was my rock bottom. I, I was ready. And uh, I phoned up a Swansea number, looked on the internet, and it was a meeting on that Sunday night in Swansea, seven o'clock till 8.30. And I phoned up and I said, hello. I said, I'm, I've got a bit of a problem. Um, I said, can I come to your meeting tonight? They said, absolutely. They said, we, we welcome all comers here. As long as you know, it's very private and confidential. Everything that happens in this room stays in the room. Um, you know, uh, can I take your name, please? And I said, yeah, it's just John, John. Okay, John, we'll see you tonight. So I went to my first meeting of GA, um, Gamblers Anonymous, and there were people in the room. It was like, just John. One looking at me as if I was John Hartson, the, the football star. Just John. David was there. Peter was there. Michael was there. Kerry was there. We're all the same. John's the same. John's there to get help. John's not the famous football player that everybody looks up to. He's a taxi driver. He's a builder. We all want the same. We all want the same, and that is to stop gambling. And we've come with our last sort of opportunity where you join the fellowship. All exactly the same people. All had divorces, done his money, spent his wedding money, lied to his missus, lied to his parents. We've all got problems in that room, and we're all... He's 28 years clean. He's seven years clean. He's four years clean. I'm one day clean. We're all the same. Nobody's different to anybody else in GA. That's what we are. We're addicts and we want to come together in a fellowship, in a group to discuss our problems and to do the 12 steps and to get through this addiction. And to this day, it's uh, nine and a half years and I've not bought one raffle ticket. I've not spent one pence on betting. And um, my life has just, just gone from there just because I've stopped gambling. And of course, you're able to live in a nice house, and you're able to have nice holidays, you're able to you know, do nice things. But it's more my mental state, my focus, uh, my demeanor, my attitude, that's changed and that's that's what Sarah that's what she wanted back you know she's from a council house I'm from a council house um I never played football for money I played for the love of the game you know I always gambled it and helped people give money away blah 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 but um it's totally changed my life really really has um and I still go to GA twice a week here in Edinburgh and I will continue to go until I'm 70 if I live that long, because what, what is an hour out of my life, two times a week? What is that if it's going to help me and if I can help other people coming in, new members? Because 10 years ago when I first went, somebody held their hand out to me. Mm. I needed help. I needed guidance. I needed a lift. I needed a kick up the backside. I needed to learn. I needed to restructure everything about gambling. I needed to raise it from my world. The realisation oh, I can never go to a racetrack again. The realisation I can never walk into a bookmaker's again. The realisation that I can't have a bet on a golf course again with my mates. Done. Gone. Finito. Gambling doesn't exist in my world anymore. You know, that is the, is the key to it all. And I managed to do it. And, um, you know, that, that's my gambling experience, you know.